O gracious God, come to us, we pray unto thee, with the resources of all thy power, that we may be strong within. We ask not, Lord, for easy lives, but for adequacy. We ask not to be freed from storms, but to build our houses on a rock that will not fall. We pray not for a smooth sea, but for a stout ship, a good compass, and a strong heart. In the name of him who faced enmity and death without flinching, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, be with us as we continue to worship you this morning with all our hearts and all our minds. Amen. Church, please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. Let us all find mercy and refuge in you, O God. Those who exalt your name will extend your love. Your favor covers creation like a shield. Through the abundance of your steadfast care, We come before your holy presence. Amen. At this time now, I ask that you all either rise with me in body or spirit as we join in the singing of the hymn found on the back of the bulletin in this very room. You may rise now. And I'm going to ask that we, um, I'm going to remind you again, but don't be seated after the song because we're going to do everything, a small portion standing today.
The invocation today is, God of justice, your word is light and truth. Let your face shine on us to restore us, that we may walk in your way, seeking justice and doing good. Amen. Now the Lord's Prayer begins with unus and unicus. Okay. Unus and unicus. Who are in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the, and the power, power and the glory, and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Don't sit down yet. That's right. <laughs> Beat me to it. Don't sit down. Uh, please join in the scene of Gloria Patri, uh, number 142 in your hymnal. Offer us something, but also ask of something as well. Well, I'm going to offer the introduction. <laughs> and then we get to sing. Uh, for those who don't, didn't get one, um, these inserts are put in your bulletin. And if I have a few extra up here if you, don't, if you did not get one. A couple of years ago, on one of my walks in the woods with my puppy, my mind drifted to reworking the verses of Kumbaya so that it would be a lullaby for a baby, like my now one-year-old granddaughter, Willa, and a lesson for a child, like my now three-year-old granddaughter, Penny. A song that gently reminds us that while there is hurt in our world, through living out love, each of us can be an answer to that hurt. Now we have sung this version together, or th sung this over the couple of summers, but it seemed appropriate that we do so again today. You might remember that Kumbaya came from the Gula culture of the islands off South Carolina and Georgia. The Gula culture developed from the peoples of many different African cultures, especially enslaved West Africans who came together there. The Gula people came to speak an English-based English Creole language containing many African loanwords and influenced by the languages and grammar that they came from. Kumbaya, come by here. Kumbaya, my lord, come by here, my lord. In my revising, and this is what you have here, I took the liberty of adding the line, he come by ya, he come by here. And I pray that this would be fitting to the Gula people, for it is from them that I drew inspiration. And it's very, this is very similar to what you may know, but you're going to have to read each verse because it's changed a little bit each time. And I'm going to have to read each verse as we go too. Okay? So together, let us sing a lullaby and a lesson, perhaps to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Oh, Lord, kumbaya. 
Come by here, my Lord, come by here. Come by here, my Lord, come by here. Come by here, my Lord, come by here. Oh, Lord, come by here. A baby's crying, Lord, kumbaya. A baby's crying, Lord, come by here. A baby's crying, Lord, kumbaya. Oh, Lord, come by here. A soothing song is sung, he come by a. A soothing song is sung, he come by here. A soothing song is sung, he come by a. Oh, Lord, you come by here. Someone's hungry, Lord, kumbaya. Someone's hungry, Lord, come by here. Someone's hungry, Lord, kumbaya. Oh, Lord, come by here. Someone's sharing now. He kumbaya, someone sharing now, he come by here. Someone sharing now, he kumbaya, oh Lord, you come by here. Someone's lonely, Lord, kumbaya. Someone's lonely, Lord, come by here. Someone's lonely, Lord, come by Oh, Lord, come by here. Someone's being a friend, he come by Someone's being a friend, he come by here. Someone's being a friend, he come by a. Oh Lord, you come by here. Someone's tired, Lord, come by a. Someone's tired, Lord, come by here. Someone's tired, Lord, come by Oh, Lord, come by here. Someone's sleeping, Lord, you are here. Someone's sleeping, Lord, you are here. Someone's sleeping, Lord, you are here. Oh, Lord, you are here. You are here, my Lord, you are here. You are here, my Lord, you are here. You are here, my Lord, you are here. Oh, Lord, you are here. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Oh, Lord, kumbaya. He kumbaya. Okay. Justin, I think, has a prayer for us. 
Probably a lot of noise down in Jerusalem right now, all this uh, coming down that way. I'm going to ask that our prayers, or prayers of the people, be a continuation of our prayer of confession this morning, and not so much a prayer of confession, but more of a prayer as a call to action. And what I'm going to do is open us up through that and kind of sandwich it. Um, I'll book in uh, a reading, but in the middle, I'm going to ask you all to respond uh, if you feel so led to the uh, what we have there in the bulletin, um, and then I will close this out. So I'll open us, uh, we'll all join together in the middle, and then I'll close this out, um, and then we'll have Glenn come up and do our scripture reading. O oh God, the one who calls us into the ways of new life, we confess the frequency of our stumblings, where instead we venture down roads that lead to desolation. God of light, you are the one that grant us wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and we confess we choose what is comfortable sometimes, comfortable ignorance, so that we might have our own way. God of holiness, who invites us into co-creating with you, let us be aware of the temptation to seek power and wealth and status as a way to be in this world. God of compassion who calls us to practice a love that reconciles all things, we confess our attachment to pettiness and distrust of what is unfamiliar. We ask for your guidance in on such things as such a time as these. Guide us, O shepherd, to life, to understanding, to true love, for the sake and betterment of the world a world your son, Jesus Christ, told us was possible. And together, God of love and justice, we believe you have called us to be in the world, but not of it. Yet we so often find ourselves captivated by the latest political ideologies. We confess that we are never free from the lure of authority and power and the ability to influence we confess that our it can be tainted and distorted by self-interest, even when we seek your will. We cannot claim to know with certainty what you would have us do or think about any particular matter of public life. Furthermore, we confess no political party can be wholly identified with you. No political ideology represents divine truth. It would be idolatrous to think so. May our righteousness help us love one another across the barriers, place in us a desire for justice and mercy, for righteous and peace. Amen. And so, God of love and of justice, we believe you have called us to be in the world, but not of it. Yet we are so often find ourselves captivated by the... Oh, I'm reading the wrong thing. I got excited. Hold on. And now... And now, hear the assurance of God's love that really is for all. Bless God, O oh my soul, my innermost heart. Bless your holy name. Bless God, O oh my soul, and hold me accountable. Let us know we are surrounded by your love and your tender affection. And like the psalmist, let us too know that we have found grace and mercy in the presence of all those in heaven. Thanks be to you, O oh God. Amen. Lynn, will you come up and get us back on track? Your scripture reading is found in Amos, the seventh chapter. And we're going to start with the tenth verse reading. How do y'all say that? Say again? She shakes her head. How do you say that? Alter. Alter. Let's see. Thank you. See, this is... <laughs> This is something I'm not used to. For I've been here 12 years and I'm still not used to it. So uh, I thought it was interesting that Amos was a northern prophet and he's being read by a southern man today. So <laughs> hope you can follow me. Amos 7, verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die with the sword, and Israel must go into exile, the way the angels And Amaziah said to Amos, 
O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac altogether. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parched out by the line. You yourselves shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. One, one small, he was, um, Amos is from the south. Um, yeah, Amos is from, so southerner preaching of a different kind of southerner, I guess. Uh, all right. A little bit like the other week, I want to start our time this morning with a question. It's a question I used to ask many of my students when I was in youth ministry. It was a question really built for Wednesday night gatherings, really to invoke meaningful conversations. It's hard to get kids to start talking in youth group. I don't know if y'all have ever been in that situation. It's a very simple question. It's very basic. And it was this. Usually at the beginning of our time, I would ask, where did you all encounter God this week? Now, I never limited it that question to asking it in a particular way. So, you know, one week I might deliver it that way, or maybe I would say it another way. I might say it like, where was God leading you this week? Or where did God show up for you this week? Another favorite rendition was, what was the Spirit inviting you to see this week? Any way you phrase it, the purpose was to get these young people to contemplate and reflect on what they saw or understood as a sacred moment. I've always loved the expression by University of Chicago professor Marcier Ilié, calling it hierophany. We've used it a few times here in the service before. It's the idea of the sacred manifesting itself before us, drawing us in, beckoning us to pay attention to what the divine would have us experience. You know, I've shared before that I really just haven't had what might be considered that maybe big, over-the-top, in-your-face kind of God moment. No burning bush for me. No, I'll say it like a southerner, no wrestling with an angel like Jacob. And since we're talking about Jacob, I saw no vision of a heavenly ladder either. Unlike Gideon, I've never been fortunate enough to find my fleece dry in a field of dew-heavy grass, assuring me that I had God's favor. And while the waters I was baptized, baptized in were extremely cold, making me shout when I came up out, I heard no voice from heaven, nor did a dove appear. I wasn't knocked down on any road to Damascus that I can recall. I just can't claim that the holy ever worked for me in such a way. And yet I know, and yet I have felt, that God nudges me often in a silent and almost convert kind of way. The Spirit of God causes my head to turn and my attention to notice something that I would have otherwise paid no mind to. In trying to describe what that feels like to me, it's, it's kind of difficult, but it's almost like a magnetic pull towards something, an opportunity to evaluate what is taking place in a moment or in a situation with a prompt that both comes from outside of me and then some really weird way from with inside me too, kind of saying like, hey fella, you might want to take notice of what's happening right now. So for me this week, in following what I believe was one of those holy nudges, I started reading and kept reading a saint who has now joined the great cloud of witnesses before us. 
I shared a quote from him last week, but James Milton Dunn and his work has been on my mind lately. His works have been in my hands lately. Dunn was known as one of those, he's one of my people, he's one of those dissenting Baptists. He was a student of T.B. Matston, professor of Christian ethics at Southwestern Seminary in Fort By God Worth, Texas. Dunn was so impacted by Matston that he too earned a Ph.D. in Christian ethics, a pursuit that would lead him to later positions as serving on the Texas Baptist Christian Life Commission and for 20 years as the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty in Washington, D.C. Dunn was also the resident professor of Christianity and public policy at Wake Forest School of Divinity. Unfortunately, Dunn was there at a time that I was not there. Our paths never had a chance to cross, but I heard much about him during my time there. Conversations from other professors, his peers and colleagues, and a lot of his former students. You know, in collecting those stories, I have little doubt that we would have had a good time together. I would have joined him in the classroom and probably outside of the classroom, too. He was known for many things, Dunn was, but soul freedom and separation of church and state, that really hovered around the top of his list. The latter really being evident from his words in 1984 that could easily be plopped down today in Sunday's paper. We are seeing in the United States today a deliberate attempt to collapse the distinction between politics and religion, which is inevitable, and merging church and state, which is inexcusable. Dunn would elaborate on this again and again over the course of his life, that lure of power that the state represents for religion, especially his own, that being Christianity. He was a Texas Baptist. He would later say, when the church maintains so close a partnership with government that one cannot tell when worship leaves off and patriotism begins, it has slipped into idolatry. Lacking that healthy distance, the prophetic vision is blurred, the witness is muffled, and the gospel, well, by God, it's compromised. He added that when the church's mission is tinted and tainted or tailored by the state, she ceases to be the bride of Christ and has fallen into the incestuous bed of cultural captivity. Heck of a writer. He was also known for telling his class, this is, I heard this from just about everybody, that you know, every professor has a go-to line that they would say every, every year, and his was this one. The trouble with a theocracy is everyone wants to be Theo. Theocracy, of course, being a system of government in which priests or those anointed as a holy authoritarian figures rule in the name of a god or a god. Dunn's life work was to fight against such a reality from coming into being. He was almost uh, considered a watchdog to ensure no one religion was preferred or held higher in higher regard more than another when it came to civic matters and laws of the land. Something he no doubt took from his spiritual forebears, John Leland, Roger Williams, Thomas Hellas, it was Hellas who considered one of the founders of the Baptist faith, along with John Smythe, who challenged King James I of King James Bible fame, writing to him the mystery of iniquity in 1612, which he stated to this. They actually brought a copy back. He was uh, away. They came back to England, and he brought a copy back to present to the king. He wrote this to King James. The king is but a mortal man and not God. Therefore, if he hath no power over the mortal soul of his subjects to make laws and ordinances for them and to set spiritual lords over them. Like Hellas, Dunn believed that kings and leaders and presidents and anybody else had no right to impose beliefs into law on the commonwealth. Much of this understanding came from Dunn's own Baptist upbringing, this, this idea of four fragile freedoms. The one he particularly leaned into was the freedom that he would call soul freedom, or that he would often refer to as soul competency. It is the competence of and of an all individuals that they have before God. As each individual has been created with the imprint or the spark of divinity placed upon him, they are endowed with the ability to freely choose, or not choose for that matter, what Dunn called being response-able. Or saying it another way, the capacity to be a grown-up, before God. In speaking of this Baptist distinction and contribution, Dunn wrote, there are other people who do a better job of evangelism than we do. There are other people who do a better job of stewardship than we do. There are a lot of other people who use just as much water to baptize people as we do. 
But there is no group on the face of the earth by their very identity and history and theological centrism that focus on the freedom of the individual before God in the way that Baptists have. Dunn lived and preached this message both in the presence of friend and those who thought him a foe. His advocation for individual freedoms, when he believed was gifted by God, by the divine, by the sacred, was something that no law, no creed, no government, no empire could bestow because they had no right to impose that which had already been given. As you might imagine, that's a hard sell for some. As you might imagine, that's a hard sell for those who think that freedom applies only to them. It's a separation, and yet it's an invocation, or an invitation of freedom. And we get to see a glimpse of that here in the book of Amos. The person of Amos we come across today in the biblical narrative is the first prophet I think of when anyone suggests that the Bible doesn't deal with what many think of when they hear the word social justice. Of all the prophets, both major and minor, Amos is concerned for the social issues of his day. To offer some context of that time, Amos comes along during the reign of King Jeroboam II. That's around the year 785 to 745 BCE. His ministry and writing, which scholars believe he did write himself, came during an era of great prosperity for that region. Amos watched as Bethel and the surrounding areas swole. They got big to a population around the range of 400,000, they believe. Of that group, the prosperity just mentions... uh, Well, it seemed only to trickle down so far. It stayed near the top of the society. Those that had money and wealth made more of it, and those who didn't were oppressed by those that did. Amos' time as a prophet, an identifier he doesn't take for himself, comes before the fall of Bethel along with the rest of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians in 722. In our reading this morning, Amos is in the midst of his call to deliver what is referred to in the life of prophets as the oracles against the nations. In the first and second chapters of Amos, he has called out neighboring nations such as Damascus and Edom and Moab. And all of a sudden he begins to shift and he turns his attention to Israel. No doubt because of the oppression he has witnessed towards the vast majority of the people there. He does this in Bethel, a location we read described as King Jeroboam's sanctuary by the professional priest there, Amaziah. Amaziah might be thought of as a head priest or a royal chief of staff at Jeroboam's royal chapel. He is well-established religious leader with a clout that obviously carries. Outside of the king and maybe a few selected others, his words probably held some of the highest power. It is likely he has been trained, too, since an early age to be in the position that he is in. Likely, too, his family is from a bunch of priests. His position and connection is of a person who has wed their religion to be the same as the throne. And thus he sees little difference from what is holy and what is monarchy. And yet his meeting here with Amos isn't outright challenged, if we look at it. He doesn't appear to question Amos' words or Amos' critique. Perhaps somewhere deep down, this professional priest knows they are justified. No, when he decides to address Amos, one who he refers to as a seer, a term that does not hold a negative connotation, it's used interchangeably with the, with the word prophet, he simply tells him he needs to leave and go back, go back and do your work somewhere else. Go back to Judah, where you're from. You see, Amos is not from the northern kingdom. He has come up from the south, down in the land of Judah. And if I imagine our buddy, Cotton Patch Gospel, Clarence Jordan, if he had done some translation in the Old Testament, he might have said something like this. (laughs) Amaziah's words being, boy, have you lost your mind. Go and take your complaints elsewhere and maybe earn a dollar or two along the way with a few amens back home with your own people. But you can't in good sense keep doing what you're doing here. Amos doesn't come back with offensive words of his own. Instead, he means to clarify who he is and why he's there. He tells the man in fancy garbs and heavy vestments and the power of the throne behind him that he's not like him. I'm no prophet, nor am I a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Amos is saying, let's clear this up. 
I'm not what you understand to be a professional prophet. I'm just a farmer. I was minding my own business, minding my own flock when the Lord called me and sent me up here. This distinction for Amos, while seemingly subtle, is letting the chief priest know that I'm not a prophet that sits on a payroll. I'm more in line with those who might understand as those roaming the countryside kind of prophets. I'm not answering to those that line my pockets. I'm doing this strictly because the Lord has set this before me. I'm not checking in with any king. I'm not checking in with any ruler or anybody else for that matter. I'm not, I, and I am not here to proclaim pious and soothing pronouncements. My business here is between me and God. God has witnessed the mistreatment of the people here. God has heard the cry of hungry mouths. God sees that those with power have misused it. And so I have been called to point this out in harsh terms nonetheless. Amos goes on to say what is coming for the northern kingdom, their destruction at the hands of the Assyrians. The kingly priest, he hears the indictment against his livelihood, against his king, and he goes back to tell the king what is happening. Notice that he doesn't relay to the king the issues that Amos brings forth. He doesn't mention the issue of poverty, or pointing out of poverty, or pointing out the exploitation being done to many. No, he leaves all that out. No, he just says, the words, king, they're just too much for the people to hear here. Let's just have him removed and send him back south and on his way. Amaziah knew that the issue of God's justice could not reach the ear of the king. Nor did he believe such difficult and harsh words should be permitted in the royal chapel. If James Dunn would have been in the king, it would have been in King Jeroboam's court that day, he might have piped up and reminded those looking to reject movements that cry for justice, those voices should be careful. The Christian who denies the social dimension of God's kingdom risks putting a premium on ignorance, resting on immoral nostalgia for things once learned, and modeling mediocrity. For Amaziah, you see, there was a limitation about what could be spoken of in the chapel or in the sanctuary. Far too often, it seems, perception and the, un and the, the desire to upkeep the status quo have needed words have kept needed words and conversations from finding their ways into sacred spaces. And for those that frequent such places, they have been less fortunate because of it. That which is difficult to stomach belongs in the house of God, for it can't, if it cannot be discussed here, where can it be discussed? James Lindbergh, professor of Old Testament Luther Seminary, once wrote that not only in Amos, but throughout Scripture, the Bible provides examples of religious types who speak for religion, who are yes-sayers, eager to endorse the views of those who support them, whose words are soothing even when they should be jarring, who shape their sermons according to their salaries. Lindbergh penned these words saying that a form of conflict should not be absent from holy places. He thought of this after hearing a friend preach one Sunday. He said his friend, this pastor, ended a very well-polished sermon by saying, Lord, preserve me from eloquence. Let my words instead have a jagged edge. A jaggedness that rubs institutions and those that upholds them wrong. A jaggedness that wields a dose of criticism at society and, and at established religion when needed. There just needs to be a few more Amoses. <laughs> there needs to be a few more Amoses and Duns to do that kind of work. There has to be some justice-filled individuals leaning into some of that soul freedom, that soul competency that Dunn spoke of, that, that will to respond and be response-able and willing to speak truth to power. The Amoses and the Duns and the other dissenting voices of the world remind us that prosperity, comfort, and embracing the privilege of power, it's always going to be forever present. Instead, might there be an alternative to respond prophetically, to choose to stand with and for the good of all and not just for some, even if it means being told that one needs to get out of the sanctuary, or maybe a more modern rendition of that would be to either love it or leave it. It's a choice. It's a choice. That's the idea. The idea of soul freedom of the individual is to choose. To be a priest, is the, well, it's the choice of either to be who these two characters are in the story today. To be a priest of the powerful, like Amaziah, or a herdsman and dresser of sycamore trees, like Amos. One whose conscience was not scared, was not coerced, 
but given the opportunity to respond and did so. It was a conscience that was claimed. And no king and no priest and no administration, no president, no Supreme Court can take away or bestow the freedom of an individual soul to choose. Nor can they enforce ideology or particular faith on any individual. Christians come to God freely or they do not come at all. Which might help us understand that there is no such thing. There is no such thing as a Christian nation. That is a farce. There are only Christian people bound to Christ by faith and not citizenship. Amos and Dunn, that talks about them, what they have done. What about you? What about us? What are we to do with these holy nudges where we feel God's presence is having us, or God's presence is having us look at something? Do we see those nudges as handed down from a divine hand that we believe we are called for such a time as this? Or do we think those nudges come from laws and regulations bestowed upon by committees and mediators and governing bodies? I believe, dear friends, that we have a calling that moves us to look beyond what is supposedly there to ensure that empires and borders stay up. We can be response-able for something else, something much bigger. And like a former colleague of Dunn wrote at his passing, the anniversary of his passing was July 4th. Um, it's been gone a few years now. But one of his colleagues wrote this about Dunn. He said, when I think of him and what he meant to me, he said, he taught me not to be afraid to say what you believe. He showed me not to be afraid to claim my conscience and let everything else just fall where it may. We have that right too. Everyone has that right. Everyone. Even if they don't look or vote or worship the way that I or you do. Amen. I invite you all now to join again by rising in body or spirit and singing hymn number 528, God of grace and God of glory.
just a reminder before we go that church council will be meeting downstairs after the service um, we'll we'll go down there and maybe there's some cornbread left I, I did tell a lot of people about it this morning so it's a chance it may not be there now um, people of God hear this word and if your soul and conscience does move you receive it as your benediction Gracious God, you have called us to be a people very much in the world, to go out and to be present and to show your love, grace, and compassion. And that means challenging, challenging those places where power is lifted up higher than morality or ethics. We ask you, we ask you to give us that, that freedom, to remind us of it, to enact on it when we need, in whichever way we have, but to never impose our freedom on another. Help us do that, Lord. Help us do that as beings created in your image and in your likeness. And all God's people said, Amen. People of God, go in peace. <laughs>